All right, here we go. It is the winter of 2021. And it's week four. It's Thursday. Off we go. We were talking about dissecting aneurysms last time. And so let's continue our discussion. How, do, how are these things classified? There's two systems that you guys need to know. There's another one that's more complicated. You don't need to know that one. But there's the Stanford system and the DeBakey system. So let's take a look at those. Uh, Stanford A, sometimes they're just called type A dissections. Sometimes they're Stanford A dissections. Sometimes they're proximal dissections. But So those are the AKAs. Look for type A or Stanford type A. And so for a Stanford type A, because there's a type A and a type B, for Stan Stanford type A dissection, it has to involve the ascending aorta. And remember the ascending aorta, I mean the heart would be attached right here. All right, so that's the ascending aorta. Once it hits that brachiocephalic, that first takeoff, that's the aortic arch from here to here. And then the descending aorta is anything down from there. All right, so if you have a Stanford A, that means that it's isolated in the ascending aorta. A for ascending aorta. Now the key with this, and this is differs from a DeBakey too, uh, it doesn't care whether or not it goes further. The only rule is it has to involve the ascending aorta. If it goes all the way down to the iliac arteries, great, it's still a Stanford A. If it only goes into the aortic arch, it's still a Stanford A. It, it doesn't matter. The only rule is it has to go into the, it has to involve the ascending aorta. Okay. This is obviously the most dangerous because it's so close to the heart and the pressure is the highest here. And this Stanford A would encompass both the DeBakey 1 and DeBakey 2 type dissecting aneurysms as well. Stanford B means the only rule is it must not involve the aortic arch or the aortic or the ascending aorta. So it can involve just the aortic arch or the uh, arch here. Uh, and maybe it's the arch and the descending aorta. Maybe it's just the descending aorta. But the rule is it cannot involve the ascending aorta. The Bakey system, this is from Robbins. Perhaps a little bit more precise. It's not still as precise as the one that vascular surgeons use. But so here we go. The Bakey one, the rule says that it has to it, it has to be in the ascending aorta, just like a Stanford A. But unlike a Stanford A, this one must progress. Stanford A doesn't care. It just has to be in the ascending aorta. This one has got to go at least into the aortic arch. It doesn't care if it goes further, uh, but it has to involve the, the ascending aorta and some other piece of that aorta. Right? These are very dangerous as well. I mean, these are both of these, Stanford A and this one, are quick surgical repair intervention. DeBakey 2 the rule on this one is it only involves the ascending aorta. It can't involve anything else. So it can't if it goes if it involves the ascending aorta and the aortic arch, then it's a DeBakey one. If it only involves the ascending aorta, then it is a DeBakey two. DeBakey three only involves the descending part of the aorta, so the thoracic aorta and or the abdominal aorta. So there is a little hole here. There is no description for an aortic arch dissecting aneurysm by itself under the DeBakey system. It, it just doesn't describe it. So that's a hole in this DeBakey system. So here's a DeBakey 1. So it must involve uh, the ascending aorta and it must go further. DeBakey 2 is isolated to the aortic arch or I keep saying the aortic arch, to the ascending aorta. DeBakey 3 is only the descending aorta. And it, can, it doesn't have to be this far. It can be just a little piece right here. Or maybe a piece down here. Got it? In reality, there's a, a much more complicated system. Uh, the Landsman's classification system is beyond our scope, but that 
is much more detailed. I won't get into that anymore. What's the epidemiology for these aortic dissections? It is the incidence is about 30, 30 cases per million of humans. So that's about 0.3% of the population each year get diagnosed with this. The prevalence, which means the the percentage of people walking around in our population who have one of these, is about 2%. It's thought to be much higher because many of these are completely asymptomatic and people just don't know whether or not they have them or not. Uh, and that, that equivalents to about 10,000 cases per year uh, is kind of the, the burden. That goes with the, the incidence up here. Females also are slightly more prone to develop these than males. All right, what about the mortality rate? So an ascending aorta dissection is very dangerous. It specifically, so a, a, now who are the ascending aorta dissecting aneurysms? The Stanford A, DeBakey 1 or DeBakey 2 all must involve the ascending aorta. So here's the rule for these things. About 1% will die per hour. So that's not good. So that means the first, uh, that, that rule holds true for the first 48 hours. So by the end of day two, about half of those affected will be dead. And this is without treatment. If you just stay at home and you don't get treatment. Um, so that's not good. 50% of the people will be dead within two days. After the 14, if you made it past the 14 uh, day period and you go to the f look at 14 days down the road, 80% of the people affected will be dead. So this is nothing to play around with. Stanford B mortality rates are not as bad, so this doesn't involve, or DeBakey 3, it doesn't involve the ascending aorta. It's quite a bit better, the 30-day mortality rate um, now, this number is with treatment and observation. It's less than 10%, so this is a much better one uh, to get. And you don't have to rush into surgery. You can use hypertensive medications to drop your pressure. Uh, you can watch and wait just to kind of see what happens. Um, that number is based on the premise that you don't have a complication. If you have concomitant aortic stenosis, or uh, a leak, maybe it's starting to hemorrhage, or the dissection is, is very long, um, then all bets are off. So the concept of retrograde dissection is important. So all of these ascending aortic or aorta dissections have the potential to rip backwards. And we, you know, I should have reviewed maybe, what is a, what is a dissecting aneurysm again? So, I mean, we got this from the last lecture. Um, here's a blood vessel. All right, here's the tunica media. Here's the tunica adventitia. This is a really big blood vessel. Let's say this is all the blood vessel. All right, I won't draw the other side. But that means, a dissection means usually that the endothelium is ripped and the blood has squirted, but it got stuck right in the tunica media. Remember, it's got that extra layer in there. And then because of the pressure, it started ripping downward, right? So you get a ripping of the wall of the vessel. And so that is a dissection. But some of them can rip their way right back in toward the heart. And that's not good because it can affect the aortic valve and damage it and cause the aortic valve to leak. And that's called aortic insufficiency or aortic regurgitation. It's just a leaky valve. And this is no good because if it ruptures and starts bleeding, you're actually inside the, uh, the pericardial cavity and you can start to fill the pericardial cavity up with blood and it can squish the heart and cause cardiac tamponade. That's called cardiac tamponade, which we will talk about when we get to the heart. Um, we are falling down a rabbit hole, so this is different than last year. So hopefully um, you guys are watching this and not last year's video. Um, here's the heart, and just a quick review. Here's the vena cava, superior vena cava, inferior ca vena cava. The blood comes in here. It goes through the tricuspid valve, goes into the right ventricle. This is the right atrium. Uh, systole occurs. It's ejected up the pulmonary trunk, 
and then it goes through the pulmonary arteries to the lungs. Not so important for our discussion, but this is really important. Now it's coming back through the pulmonary veins, going into the left atrium, and then this is one of the stars of the show today. This is the mitral valve. It goes through the mitral valve into the left ventricle, and then ventricular systole occurs. It goes out through this guy, definitely the star of the show today as well. That's the aortic valve into the ascending aorta. That's all ascending aorta. There's the aortic arch, just this part, and that's the descending aorta. So with that in mind, and make sure you know that because you're going to be completely lost if you don't remember that stuff. Let's talk about aortic regurgitation. So whether it comes from a DeBakey 1, DeBakey 2, Stanford A aneurysm, or maybe the valve, maybe of Marfan syndrome, if this valve doesn't catch blood during diastole, uh, it's going gonna, it's gonna to gush into the left ventricle. Right? It's going to overfill the left ventricle because we're not supposed to have, we're only supposed to have one source of ventricular filling and that's from the left atrium. So now we got two sources so you're going to overfill the ventricle. And remember that during systole the artery expands because of the elasticity of the tunica media. During diastole the artery snaps back and it pushes blood back toward the heart and these semilunar valves, specifically the aortic valve here, is going to catch that blood and pop shut. That's what's supposed to happen, but if this valve doesn't work, you're going to backwash blood right into the left ventricle. And that ain't good. And that is called aortic regurgitation. Aortic after the aortic valve is the one that's messed up. Okay, There could be pulmonic valve regurgitation, but usually not because that side of the heart is under less pressure. So we usually talk about regurgitation stenosis. The key is usually the left side of the heart. All right, so this is a aortic regurgitation is a diastolic event, ventricular diastolic event. And as I said, blood leaks back into the ventricle. And heart valve prolapse. Uh, so yeah, ev everything I just said already, those who have a damaged or overstretchy heart valves, uh, they don't seal good dur during diastole, and that goes for any heart valve, including the mitral valve. And blood can regurgitate back in. Um, and there's two classic types of these heart valve prolapses. Uh, there's aortic valve prolapse, a.k.a. aortic insufficiency, and mitral valve prolapse, a.k.a. mitral valve insufficiency. Let's look at aortic regurgitation. That's kind of where we are. And I just, these are brand new slides, too. I just put these in a couple hours ago. So there might be a little spelling here and there, but aortic valve uh, is da if it's damaged, it can allow blood to regurgitate back into the ventricle. Great. So what? Well, you'll wreck your heart with the passage of time uh, with this phenomenon. And when you ruin your heart, you eventually get a, a condition or, or a, a syndrome, a diagnosis of cardiomyopathy, which is a broad category. It just means your heart is failing to pump blood. Specifically, this is a type of valvular cardiomyopathy. Right? So what's the physiology behind this? Heaven forbid would Dr. Doe flash back. Um, so pathophysiology of this. So if you have blood regurgitating into the left ventricle from the ascending aorta, um, you are definitely going to increase the stroke volume because you're adding blood from the, a the aorta, which you're not supposed to, and you're adding uh, blood from the the left atrium as well. Um, so you're going to also increase the end diastolic volume because you have two sources as well. And that's what will increase the stroke volume right there. So you will be blasting, truly blasting more blood out of your left ventricle if you have aortic regurgitation. It's not enough to cause hypertension though, if some of you are wondering that. And yeah, because of the two sources, as I said. And yeah, so what's the, who cares? Isn't that great? So we have more blood. No, it's not great. Because if you overstretch the myocardium of the heart from overfilling it, you're going to en enact Starling's Law. And that's, that means that on every beat of the heart, the heart is pumping really powerfully, super, super powerfully. 
more powerfully than it's supposed to. And your heart can't take that. After a while, you're going to wreck your heart. Right? So continuous super forceful contractions will wreck your heart. Uh, and yeah, and you developed wrecked heart because of a valve problem. It's called valvular cardiomyopathy. Okay? And that's not at all. There's another problem. So because of this unexpected volume in the left ventricle, during during atrial systole, the atrium can't completely empty. It still overstuffs the left ventricle, but it can't completely empty. And therefore, it acts as a beaver dam. You can't fill, you can't get the blood, the normal amount of blood out of your lungs doesn't happen because of the beaver dam, because there's too much blood in the left atria. And so now we have a, the heart acting as a beaver dam, and we've talked about that already quite a bit. So that's going to increase the pressure within the microcirculation of the lungs, and that's going to lead to pulmonary edema. So you might start oozing a little bit of blood into the alveoli, and now the right heart is it's backed up all the way to the right heart. The right heart is starting to have trouble and trying to pump harder to fix this problem, and then you wreck the right side of your heart. So that just contributes to a general cardiomyopathy. Okay, some fun facts about aortic regurgitation. Uh, you could see what's called a water hammer pulse or a Watson's water hammer pulse, uh, where when you, I mean, you could palpate it. You don't even have to palpate it. You can look at their, uh, next to their Adam's apple or next to their laryngeal prominence, and you will see a gigantic pulsation every time systole occurs. And it's very short-lived. It almost bugs way out and then quickly sucks back in because of the regurgitation. Um, so, yeah. And, again, this condition doesn't cause a significant hypertension, that big blast of uh, blood. All right, what about mitral valve regurgitation? Uh, so this is a little bit different. So this is when, during ventricular systole, some of the blood squirts out of the left ventricle and kind of goes back into the left atrium where it's not supposed to go. Remember, the mitral valve is supposed to shut, so that doesn't happen. But so during ventricular systole, you have blood flying out of the left ventricle as normal up the ascending aorta, but some of the blood is also flying into the left ventricle. What's the bottom line there? Well, you're not you're not getting a, a huge amount of blood flying out of the heart because you're losing some of it. Um, so, yeah. During diastole, though, the left ventricle is going to be overfilled again because you have overpressurized the left atrium uh, and you've shot extra blood into it, and now you've got blood from the lungs trying to jam in there, and so you got too much pressure in there. Uh, when when diastole occurs, it's going to overfill the left ventricle again uh, because it's the left atrial pressure is so high, it just injects blood into the, into the left ventricle. And therefore, Starling's Law again will be inactivated and you're going to wreck your heart with this condition. What's the difference between mitral regurgitation and aortic regurgitation? In aortic regurgitation, you're going to have a very strong blast of blood coming out of the ascending aorta, uh, and you get that water hammer pulse. But in mitral regurgitation, you actually don't have much blood coming out, and the end diastolic volume and the stroke volume are actually decreased. And these patients, they suffer hypotension. They have low blood pressure uh, because of this. All right, but they will develop a valvular cardiomyopathy. Um, so aortic regurgitation patients, they will have, not hypertension, they'll have normal pressure, but mitral valve regurgitation patients, they will have hypotension and all the stuff that goes along with that. All right, and if, if that ain't enough, the same story, the overfilled left atrium can't completely empty and it acts as a beaver dam and causes pulmonary hypertension, pulmonary edema, and right heart failure, and the whole whole nine yards. 
All right, and here's even though the stroke volume is technically increased in this case, um, the amount of blood entering the ascending aorta is significantly decreased. That's because the blood is escaping into the left atrium. Everything I've already said. But they do have hypotension. They will suffer orthostatic hypotension, which basically people with, not all people, but most, most people with hypotension uh, will develop this orthostatic hypotension. What does that mean? That means that you stand up, uh, you're laying down in bed, or you're watching TV in a recliner, and you get up quick, and you get really, really dizzy because your blood pressure drops by more than 10 millimeters. And it can stay that way for a long time in some people. All right, so here's everything I said already. But you can see systole occurring here. Blood's flying out the ascending aorta. Blood's also leaking and filling up this left atrium when it shouldn't be. All right, uh, more sequelae. There is more sequelae. So with both of these regurgitant diseases, so mitral valve prolapse and aortic valve prolapse, there's another thing that can happen. Uh, and it's really a sequelae of the heart trying to pump. Uh, Starling's law constantly enforced the heart, just like a bodybuilder, starting to get very muscular. And in some people, as it gets muscular, it starts to squeeze the coronary arteries and to the point where it starts to act like a beaver dam and it cuts off blood flow to the heart. And that ain't good, right? So that will contribute to the death of, of heart tissue. That's actually, when that happens, that's called ischemic cardiomyopathy. All right. Yep, that's everything I just said. The heart's going to become muscle-bound, uh, and yeah, you develop... Uh, hypertrophy, but you but it also fails. Ischemia, let's see, I think I said this already too, heart, uh, the myocardium has become hypertrophic, it squeezes the coronary arteries um, between itself and the epicardium. This is everything I said already. The patients get a progressive ischemia of the myocardium and it leads to severe heart failure, ischemic cardiomyopathy. Everything I said already. Uh, the water hammer pulse, we talked about this in lab, but Remember the AKAs, Corgan's pulse, a collapsing pulse, uh, and you can mix any of these terms, a Corgan's water hammer pulse, I've heard it. And again, this is not for mitral regurgitation, this is only for aortic valve regurgitation. And it, their, their carotid artery bugs out, visibly bugs out every time systole occurs. And that's because of starlings or fractured. I'm getting a little sloppy here, and I should be saying Frank Starling's Law because there's a difference between Starling's Starling forces and Frank Starling's Law. That's different, different dudes. Um, yeah, if you lift your arms over the head, it uh, puts more blood in the system, and it makes that more exaggerated. All right, uh, typical. Are we out of the rabbit hole? We're out of the rabbit hole. So, typical clinical presentation of a a type A DeBakey 1 DeBakey 2 aneurysm, so a bad evil dissecting aneurysm of the ascending aorta. So the man comes into the ER with a horrible chest pain. Um, he may have radiating pain to the scapula, but here's the key with these. The, the pain will start to move across the chest and then down, like it's following the descending aorta. That's always a bad sign that he has a ripping dissection going on. And, of course, the symptoms can look very similar to myocardial infarction. So they order troponin levels, and those are okay. They can do an EKG, and it's probably going to be okay. Uh, the hypertension uh, is probably going to be there. The heart is freaking out. Uh, maybe the dissection is causing the false lumen to compress the true lumen. You're starting to get ischemia, and your heart is going to pump harder to try to properly perfuse body tissue. If you develop hypotension, really bad sign. That means that one of those dissections is leaking somewhere, and that's a really bad sign. Here's a 65-year-old longtime smoker comes in, non-localized chest pain, dyspnea. Uh, so he's having trouble breathing, very cold feet. Oscillatory heart exam 
it shows he has tachycardia. There's no murmurs. You could do EKG. That's normal. A palpatory exam demonstrates the lower extremities are really cold to the touch compared to the upper extremities. Uh, arterial examination finds really low thready pulses in all lower extremities, including the femoral pulses. The upper extremities are crazy strong. Uh, there's no water hammer pulse, though. So what do you think of that? You order a CT, too, just to be sure. There's the hint. Yep, we got a beaver dam. So there's that patient. Um, so we have, this is a false lumen. That's the dissecting aneurysm here. That's the tunica media part of it, how you can see there. This is the true lumen. And the true lumen is compressed to probably half of its size, more than half of its size. So that's why the lower extremities aren't getting any um, any blood. Right, so everything I just said. He ended up having a coarctation of the aorta, which is a congenital narrowing of the thoracic aorta, usually right after the left subclavian takeoff from the aortic arch. All right, let's shift over to something that you have to watch out for because you can see these on your chiropractic x-rays and you better catch these. So abdominal aorta, of course, comes through the aortic hiatus here, goes down and splits. We have renal arteries. Um, this is the danger zone right here. If, the, if these are going to develop, if you're going to get one of these, and we've seen these in cadavers anyway. I, I don't know, did I have... I don't think I was teaching anatomy anymore. I can't remember. Uh, but we've always seen, we've had several cadavers with these abdominal aortic aneurysms right here. And yeah, there's the celiac trunk. And so let's get into this. Here's what I mean. There is a real uh, abdominal aortic aneurysm here in this cadaver. And you see how it happens downstream from the renal artery takeoffs. It's because the renal vein crosses here, they think, and it might put a swirl of blood maybe that over time, if especially if you have some predisposed weakness, can make that worse. Um, but highest, the target age is over 65. Uh, the incidence of this has been on the rise, and they're not exactly sure what the deal is with that. It typically occurs downstream to the renal veins and renal arteries, um, and uh, often associated with more aneurysms in the common iliac artery. So, and here's that renal vein, how it crosses over, and maybe a swirl of blood happens right here, and over time starts to balloon that out. Okay, um, what type of aneurysm? Because we talked about the fusiforms and the sacculars last time, and the true and false aneurysms. Remember, saccular and fusiform were true aneurysms. False aneurysms is where you have a rip and a tear in the t in the tunica intima. But these are usually fusiform in design. Occasionally they're saccular, uh, but usually fusiform. And they can be dissecting, too. You, a lot of times you can't tell. You need a CT or something to look inside to tell an axial view. Uh, they, they have been seen in 15 centimeters diameter or more even 25 centimeters. Normally, to give you an idea of how big that one, that one's, pro one's, uh, that one's probably, what, about four, three, four centimeters. When they get over 5.5 centimeters, that's emergency surgery. And some people have come in with these things 15 centimeters in size, and they're leaking. So they can get really, really big, but five mil, about 5.5 millimeters is the cutoff. They are the 15th leading cause of death in the United States. The surgical techniques have gotten really good, uh, so the death rate has dropped because of that. And prompt surgical management is the key to staying alive. So look at this one. Hopefully you will never miss something like that. Um, but there, you can see it right here. If the patient has Munkberg's mediosclerosis, which is one of the subtypes of arterial sclerosis, along with atherosclerosis, um, you'll see it. If they just have atherosclerosis, you won't see it, because it's the Munkberg's that lays down the calcium. So that's Munkberg's mediosclerosis there. Uh, but even the on some studies, the rate of misdiagnosis, radiologists 
trained board certified radiologist miss is almost 50 percent 42 percent so you gotta be sharp and watch these things here's a patient I had radiologist completely miss this one uh, so 65 year old for chronic low back pain uh, the physical was negative he had Kemp's test was positive for back pain uh, but he brought his he consulted with me brought his or sent me a CD uh, and I'm like whoa did you know you have an aneurysm like, what no so he's got a, a 2.6 centimeter aneurysm or 26 millimeters which isn't dangerous yet but it does deserve monitoring and here's kind of the monitoring chart um, so if they're between 2.5 and 2.9 you should have a repeat a repeat at least an ultrasound every five years just to check it and it, if they get up to I mean five five and a half millimeters you're you need a repeat ultrasound every three to six months and the rule is if it's over 5.5 you uh, centimeters in size you're going to need to have surgery you should have surgery on that and the surgical what is the surgical treatment it's a endovascular aneurysm repair it's called or ever and it's uh, yeah it's fairly successful they've gotten pretty good at it so let's take a look at the ever procedure so they stick a catheter this is they don't have to open you up this is all done from the inside and they, they open the catheter up and pop this uh, this graft out and uh, it snaps outward and it wedges itself here they don't have to cut the old tissue off but it stops the blood flow this will just atrophy away so they basically have given you a new vessel from the inside out what's the natural history of these things they do tend to get bigger with the passage of time that's why you have to monitor them on average it's about half a centimeter per year and they're always almost always completely asymptomatic if they start to get symptomatic you're in big trouble usually uh, where does it typically rupture in the front the back the side it typically ruptures if one of these aneurysms is going to pop and bleed they typically rupture posterior posteriorly into the retroperitoneal space and that's a good thing so here's the belly up here this is the axial view let's get adjusted um, that's the front this is the the back side here that's the front I call it belly that's a terrible way to do it um, here's the abdominal aorta there's the vena cava here and they usually rupture right back here and the blood goes into this retroperitoneal space um, and it hurts like hell when these things rupture but there's a weird phenomenon we'll look at where this can fill with blood so quickly that it acts the pressure starts to increase and you get kind of a compartment syndrome here and it can actually the pressure can match the pressure inside the the aorta and it'll stop leaking for a while and that gives patients a false sense of security so about 20 percent of the ruptures occur anteriorly uh, those are bad when it does that those are into the peritoneal cavity causes weird symptoms when they rupture anteriorly you can get groin pain or testicular pain if you're a guy 80% um, rupture posteriorly into the retroperitoneal space uh, and the problem is you can start leaking out blood and go into hypovolemic shock and here's a brand new rabbit hole for you guys another I was very busy today spent a lot of time on these slides we put in a new section uh, because I know this is high yield stuff on board so we're gonna get a little deeper into shock so I really like this slide right here so shock there's different kinds of shock there's five some say there's six different types of shock um, some classify four types of shock so there's all different ways to classify it's a big mess uh, but they all do the same thing your blood run, runs out of oxygen your tissue starts starving and you can die if you don't correct this so you're hyper perfused or hypo perfused hypo perfused and it's dangerous I mean you you kill your brain and you know that's it it's all over you your heart dies your liver dies your kidneys die no good so there's five different types there's cardio and this is according to board books so there's there's cardiogenic shock 
which the heart is the problem. There's hypovolemic shock, which we'll look at. And then there's septic shock, anaphylactic shock, and neurogenic shock. Now, the board books don't say this, but they should. These three are clumped under a cate category called distributive shock. All right, so let's take a look at these different types. Let's look at cardiogenic shock. That's a fairly easy one. Um, it's caused by a failure of the heart to eject blood out and sufficiently efficiently or sufficiently perfuse the body. So the heart as a pump is not working and you get a massive decrease in uh, stroke volume because of this and there goes your perfusion. What are the causes of cardiogenic shock? Well you can break them down into three categories and then we'll look at it in more detail. So there's ba basically the myocardium fails. The myocardium is ischemic, it doesn't work good anymore. It's bulky, it's been on steroids, it's a bodybuilder and it doesn't work good anymore. You can have really bad heart arrhythmias that do the same thing, like especially PVCs, if you have a high burden of PVCs. I mean really high burden, which is unusual. Um, then you don't get a good, good blood ejection from the heart. And then mechanical blockages from the heart. So let's look at these uh, more specifically. So car back to cardiomyopathy again. If the, if the heart muscle is failing and you can't eject blood from the heart, uh, well, you can slip into cardiogenic shock uh, because not enough blood is going around to perfuse the body tissue. So the, there's some different causes. There's coronary artery disease. That's called ischemic cardiomyopathy. There's myocardial infarction. One of the most common causes of cardiogenic shock is myocardial infarction. And then there's valvu valvular disease. Uh, so the regurgitant diseases, the stenotic diseases, uh, can all stop blood from coming out of the heart. Right? I mean, I should have really put mitral valve disease there, right? Because aortic regurgitant disease, that's not going to decrease blood. But it, I mean, it eventually will because it'll ruin your heart. That's why I kept it there. So I guess I will keep it there. Remember, you said the sequelae of aortic stenosis, even though it doesn't cause a hypotension like mitral valve stenosis does, it does eventually ruin the heart so that you get cardiomyopathy. All right. Um, yep, and chronic hypertension. How would chronic hypertension cause cardiomyopathy? Well, if you have really high pressure in the blood, even during diastole, it's going to be harder for the heart to open the aortic valve. It's going to take a higher pressure and the heart's going to have to pump harder. So you basically wear your heart out fighting against that hypertension. What are the causes of cardiogenic shock? Um, so some more causes. We just talked about cardiomyopathy. Uh, severe arrhythmias, especially vent uh, ventricular related arrhythmias where you're your ventricles can't pump out enough blood. Even atrial fib, if you're not getting, if the AV, the AV node is not slowing those signals down, if the ventricles run too fast, that can cause a decrease in blood flow as well. Chamber obstruction is obvious, so if you have aortic valve, mitral valve stenosis, you can't get blood. There's, those are beaver dams. You can't get blood through the heart. If you have a large pulmonary embolism, um, that will do the trick as well. Cardiac tamponade from squeezing the heart, that'll do the trick. Uh, or just a flat-out tumor. Maybe you have a tumor growing out in your your left atrium. Any type of beaver dam will do the trick. Sequelae of cardiogenic shock, well, they all cause decreased cardiac output and decreased stroke volume. And that's going to decrease the cardiac output. I mean, that's you need that to perfuse your body, so you'll eventually die of hypoxia. Okay, now what about hypervolemic shock? Hypervolemic shock. That should be hypovolemic shock, right? Hypovolemic shock. These are brand new slides, so uh, 60, see if I can remember that. Hypovolemic shock. Um, so there's a bunch of causes for hypo, but they all have the same theme to them. 
that means that the blood volume is too low. It's a problem with blood volume. And if it's too low, then you can't perfuse the tissue. Right? And then same story. You can't perfuse the tissue. Your tissue starts dying. So there are all sorts of things that can cause decreased blood volume. Let's take a look at them. Another slide I like. Very busy slide, but got to know this stuff. So what can decrease the volume, the amount of blood flowing through your veins? Well, a leak. What if you've sprung a leak in some of your vessels? Um, so that's actually called a subcategory of hypovolemic shock. Is called hemorrhagic shock. So hemorrhagic shock will cause hypovolemic shock. I know that's confusing, but that's the way it is. Um, so, yeah, so if you get an aneurysm and it ruptures, you're going to be bleeding. You're going to go into hypovolemic shock. Your blood, you're not going to have as much blood in the pipes anymore. That's actually the most common cause. Then there's the dehydrations where you lose blood fluid. Remember, we talked specifically about how the capillaries... The proximal capillary dumps interstitial fluid or blood fluid out into the interstitium and it has to be returned in the distal capillary or else you'll get swelling. Uh, well, that's going to come into play here in a minute. But hypertension or high dehydration is you, from gastroenteritis, you're just, you usually have diarrhea accompanied with gastroenteritis and you just can't, your intestines can't suck water back in like they're supposed to. If you get dehydrated, um, there goes your, your blood. Your blood needs that water to, to have volume to it. Anaphylaxis, so if you have uh, an allergen of some kind, mast cells go wild and start releasing histamine. If you have too much histamine, it's going to open up too many capillaries. And if you open up too many capillaries, too much blood fluid drains out into the interstitium and you can't bring it back. Severe burns, we talked about. We need albumin and globulin and the other blood proteins. We need that to suck, help suck through oncotic forces. We need to suck fluid out of the interstitium. And so without albumin, um, we can't do that. And there, there you go into hypovolemic shock. Right In severe burns, you destroy so much tissue that the albumin just leaks right out into the interstitium. And it can't be replaced. Kidney disease. So you're not supposed to lose proteins into the urine or into the filtrate, and that's exactly what can happen. You lose filtrate, or you lose albumin into the filtrate, uh, then you can't, your whole body tissue is going to swell, and there goes your blood volume. Diabetes insipidus, we just have been talking about that, if that's untreated. Uh, so diabetes insipidus, you can't, you can't suck free water back into your, uh, you can't suck that filtrate water out and you have polyuria. Right, that's underproduction of ADH and diabetes insipidus. Addison's disease, you don't make cortisol, but you don't make aldosterone either, so you can't absorb salt and water. Uh, so you can start to go, become, go hypovolemic with that. Liver disease, you can't make the albumin, therefore you can't, suck the tissue, suck the blood fluid back in like you're supposed to. That's a busy slide. Uh, hemorrhagic shock. So um, that is a subcategory of hypovolemic shock, as we said already. Kind of talked about this, uh, but occur, we'll do it again. occurs from a leak in a blood vessel, uh, which decreases the blood volume. If you leak blood out of the blood vessels, you don't, there goes your blood volume, right? That can cause hypovolemic shock. There's three basic causes. There's internal hemorrhage. That would be a abdominal aortic aneurysm rupturing. There's external hemorrhage from trauma, uh, where you can get your finger cut off or get a bad cut in your arm, and you're bleeding externally. That'll also decrease blood volume. And then there's a long bone fracture. The uh, femur is very vascular, and it bleeds like crazy if you fracture it badly. Uh, clinically, what do you was hypovolemic shock present with? Well, <laughs> decreased blood pressure. The epinephrine will be secreted, AVP will be secre secreted, the sympathetics will be on. They'll all be shutting off uh, the blood supply to the dermis and skin, 
and so you'll have cold clammy skin trying to save some of that blood for the core your pulse is going to be thready it's going to be weak from the low blood volume uh, but the heart's going to be trying to compensate by pumping harder if your heart is pumping harder you're going to have tachypnea uh, if it's bad enough you're going to be confused your brain's not going to be working good because you don't have good oxygen all right another category is called distributive shock i did not introduce this last quarter so this is brand new stuff um, so means hypovolemia has occurred because of some pathological redistribution of blood fluid okay so generally there's two things that can cause this kind of redistribution of fluid either a loss of tone of the arterioles and venules remember we said that the arterioles and venules have a very thick tunica media and they are in a state of vasoconstriction all the time so you don't overpressurize the capillaries right if you if they lose that tone and you pop arterioles wide open you'll get way too much pressure going through the capillaries and you'll dump way too much blood fluid into the interstitium and you won't be able to suck that back up and you'll start going into shock because there goes your blood volume three main categories septic shock anaphylactic shock and neurogenic shock I'm just going to talk a little bit about each one so septic shock means the immune system is responding to some bug like a staph like a virus or bacteria that's gotten into the bloodstream this is really complicated more complicated than this but in general a bug has gotten into the blood and your body it's the bug is attached to endothelial cells all over the body and your body is sees that bug and is mounting a inflammation it's calling in it's the endothelial cells are releasing cytokines and cytokines are calling in the troops and you're getting a massive inflammation and that massive inflammation causes increased capillary permeability uh, so because you want to you want the troops to be able to get between the endothelial cells of the capillaries to get in and fight the bug the bug has now gotten underneath the endothelial cells into the blood vessel wall um, and that's it if you dilate the the microcirculation vasodilate it and if you increase capillary capillary permeability you're dumping your you're losing too much blood fluid and that's the problem you can't return enough blood fluid back into the blood and now your blood fluid is gone and you go into shock because of that in fact that's the mechanism with all of these anaphylaxis anaphylaxis is the same thing but instead of a bug it's a allergen or it's an antigen or allergen you can call it either one something you're allergic to has gotten into your body and your body is freaking out and mast cells are releasing histamine everywhere and histamine uh, does the same thing on the microcirculation it causes a relaxation of the tone of the arterioles and venules so that overloads the capillaries uh, makes the capillary pressure too high and it causes the uh, the capillaries to be too permeable too leaky bottom line is the blood fluid dumps into the interstitium all over the body and there goes your blood volume and you go into shock neurogenic shock is problems with the autonomic nervous system number one causes a spinal cord injury where the sympathetics are taken out of action because remember there's a play between nitric oxide and the sympathetic outflow to keep the the size of the lumens uh, the lumen of the microcirculation just right so it properly pr pressurizes the the capillaries but if you have an injury to the spinal cord and you lose the sympathetic tiger nitric oxide rules and you're going to do the same thing you're going to vasodilate the microcirculation and the capillary permeability is going to increase and you're going to lose blood fluid into the interstitium and you can't return it there goes your pressure there goes your blood volume and yep the whole nine yards then go into shock from that out of that rabbit hole uh, signs let's just finish this up and we'll call it a day. short lecture but there's some potent stuff in here that you got to know good high yield board stuff 
What are the signs of a ruptured abdominal aortic aneurysm? Good study on this one, a meta-analysis done by Azer, ETO, et al. Um, and they studied 700 patients, the symptoms of 700 patients who presented with a bleeding abdominal aortic aneurysm. Number one finding was abdominal pain. Number two finding was they were shocky hypovolemic symptoms. So they had hypo, low blood pressure and tachycardia. They had number three finding. Uh, most of them you could palpate the abdominal aorta and you could feel the aneurysm. And then back pain and then syncope was last. And by far, abdominal pain was the most common. Statistically different than the rest of these symptoms. So the big one was abdominal pain. Back pain was in there, but not as common as abdominal pain. Now here's that strange phenomenon. Let's come back to that. We said that if an abdominal aortic aneurysm is going to rupture, it's going to do so posteriorly. And it fills up uh, that space that retroperitoneal space with blood and you're going to have pain at first, probably abdominal pain, but then it's going to stop because once the pressure in the retroperitoneal space builds to the same level as that of inside the aorta, the blood will stop leaking. So it'll give you time to go to the hospital, um, but patients may say, oh, it was just a bug or something. I'm not going to go to the hospital. It'll kill you because eventually it's going to come back again. It's going to rip into the, the real peritoneal cavity, and then you're going to be gone. It's also a fatal mistake to uh, when a patient comes in with abdominal pain uh, and low blood pressure, instinctively the staff wants to boost that pressure back up, but they need to make sure it's not an abdominal aortic aneurysm because if they maybe it's one of these compartment syndrome deals where the aneurysm has, was leaking and there's a compartment syndrome and it stopped leaking and if you boost the pressure that'll raise the pressure and make it leak again once it rips into the peritoneal cavity and that peritoneum peritoneum is not that thick or not that strong so um, you gotta be very careful about doing resuscitation fluid resuscitation on these patients and um, yep you're out of time eventually it's gonna rip into the uh, the retroperitoneal cavity will rip into the real peritoneal cavity massive bleeding will occur and the patient will die. Uh, how about some risk factors? Atherosclerosis is a huge risk factor for this. We've Have we talked about that yet? No, I don't think we have yet, uh, but we will. It weakens the tissue wall. We have talked about it a little bit. Um, it weakens the, the blood vessel wall, makes it more amenable to stretching out. Uh, there is a butterfly abdominal aorta there and you can see this big aneurysm with a blood clot in it and all that yellow gunk that's all atherosclerotic plaque um, you can get a thrombus too the atherosclerosis uh, and the blood flow within an abdominal aortic aneurysm the blood flow is terrible there and so it's really easy to to get a thrombus formation or a quote blood clot formation in there and that can break loose and if that's happening in the ascending aorta, you can get a stroke from something like that. Even if it's in the descending aorta, that, that piece of thrombus, that embolism can go downstream. Maybe it'll get stuck in the celiac trunk, and now you're, there goes your liver, and there goes your stomach, and there goes your spleen. So it can be devastating. Arterial embolisms are devastating. Um, there's just another, almost the same one as before, showing the aneurysm with 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 a thrombus formation in there. Uh, what about AA versus the R2A system? Yeah, if you get an abdominal aortic aneurysm in the right spot, it can pinch the renal artery and cause ischemia to the kidney, and that will turn on the R2A system. So you could get a secondary hypertension uh, from an abdominal aortic aneurysm because of this. Other sequelae, it could, if it's in the right spot, pinch the ureters and cause a beaver dam in the ureter and that could back up pressure into the kidney and it could damage your kidney uh, from that. Same thing, it could compress your, your superior inferior mesenteric arteries and you could lose your bowel from that. 
all depends where it happens. Vertebral erosion, yep, if it's in the right place, it can, I think we looked at something like this already, but these arteries are pulsatile in nature, and it could, it could erode the bone, like this big one here, that's a gigantic one, uh, and it's eroded, it's kind of hard to see, but it's eroded that bone right away. Not so fun fact, so in the emergency room, about 50% of these ab ruptured abdominal aortic aneurysms, uh, they die within the first 24 hours after diagnosis. The surgical repair is effective if you catch it in time, but make sure you go to a big hospital, not a little tiny hospital. All right, that is enough. See you guys later.